It is a piece of our city's history that 40 years later, it's really hard to believe. The Atlanta child murders, 29 black kids dead. It's almost 40 years and he's still the same conniving, manipulative person that he's always been. Wayne Williams suspected, but never charged. Wayne Williams didn't kill our children. No closure, just questions. I'm not old, really. I'm still not over. I think about it all the time. Now, lost evidence and a secret investigation. You gotta find a lot of records was intentionally destroyed by these agencies. And a renewed search for answers. To know that the family still don't have peace is quite unsettling. This is murder in black and white. I'm Naima Abdullahi. 11 Alive has spent the past five months unraveling one of the most haunting chapters of Atlanta's history. The Atlanta child murders terrorized black neighborhoods from 1979 to 1981 and took the lives of 29 kids and young adults. But now, four decades after it began, the notorious investigation is now back open and what we found hidden inside old documents and new interviews may just shed fresh light on this cold case. Now this all started back in February when I sat down with Miss Catherine Leach. It was her heartfelt plea for her son and the other child murder victims that changed the course of this investigation forever. 40 painful years later. It feels like we never got to the bottom of who who did everything. The infamous killing spree that terrorized Atlanta's black neighborhoods still weighs heavy on the children of that era, like Timothy Freeman. Coming up black, we already knew we had to watch our back. 29 black children killed between 1979 to 1981, a case that would notoriously be known as the Atlanta Child Murders. Vincent Richardson, still haunted by those memories. Did you know any of the victims? Yeah, I actually was uh, best friends with Curtis Walker brother. I knew Curtis also. He was like our little brother, you know. Curtis Walker left for dead at 13 years old. The suspect in all the cases, Wayne Williams, never convicted of killing Curtis and all the other children. Curtis Walker's mother, Catherine Leach, still relives the agonizing funeral. The pain that you felt that day, you don't get over something like that. I, I'm not over, I'm still not over. I think about it all the time. Where was he headed when he went missing? That day he had got out of school and I told him, Mama don't want y'all to go out dog. 40 years later, the family and friends of Curtis Walker now have one request. It needs to be a memorial. I mean, that doesn't ease the pain, but it just gives them some sort of comfort, you know, knowing that they can go back and just think about what they could have been. Ms. Catherine Leach says she made this request for a memorial with previous Atlanta City Council members. These were the previous attempts that you have had to get a memorial or a yeah. monument for the kids. This will be helped to restore honor and respect to the parents who lost their children and to the children who lost their lives through no fault of their own. And now with Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms in office, she's once again pleading. If you could share one message with Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, what would it be? Can you please help us get a monument, a plaque. And she'll keep waiting for a memorial, each name engraved into the history books finally in an honorable way. I'm still standing, I'm still, I'm still wanting it. Miss Catherine never imagined outliving her baby boy, but she says she'll keep living for him and all the other children. I want them to come forth and help me with the dream that I had for the, for the children of, of Atlanta. We took Ms. Catherine's plea straight to the mayor's office. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms was so moved by our story, she decided to take quick action. I want to know who killed Curtis. Mayor, when you first watched Ms. Catherine Leach's plea, what kind of went through your head, especially you growing up in Atlanta as a child during that era? I knew about it because I was nine years old in 1979 when the murders began. And each time I watch her speak and I've watched her story, um, it, it just, it breaks my heart 
I cry with her. For a decision to be made, for the evidence to be reevaluated, what does that do for the city and what does that do for Atlanta's historic African American communities who endured that amount of pain nearly 40 years ago until now? And I hope that it says to the public that our children matter. African American children still matter. Did you know any of the kids, any of the victims personally? I didn't, but it was interesting as we were speaking and I was reading the names, there's so many names that I remember. I remember their pictures on the news and, you know, it, it's, uh, it is a piece of our city's history that 40 years later, it's really hard to believe to know that the family still don't have peace um, is, is quite unsettling. What crosses my mind is what they could have been and who they could have been, because that could have been any child during that time. It could have been any of us. It could have been any of us. I'm grateful to you, and I just appreciate your bringing attention in and allowing people like Mrs. Leach to be able to speak and, and share their pain because for her, she lives it every day. With news of the cases reopening, more families decided to come forward with hopes of finally sharing their stories. Like Miss Lois Evans. Now, for decades, she stayed silent, knowing her son's death was just the start of the horrific Atlanta Chow murders. Summer of 1979. He had just graduated from seventh grade. The start of the city's nightmare. But he left to go and he never did come back. So I get on the phone calling around trying to find him, but I never did. Alfred Evans disappeared and was found dead at Niski Lake Road in southwest Atlanta. I didn't want to believe it. I'm still puzzled now. Lois Evans is still waiting for justice to find out what happened to her son and the other children. So is Isaac Rogers, who believes his brother Patrick was murdered by Wayne Williams. They got the right guy. That was one of the most frightening times in my life. Isaac says he escaped Wayne Williams when he was seven years old, that he was almost a victim when he walked to a neighbor's apartment with his two cousins. As we got ready to exit her porch and walk down the stairs, that's when the guy that I now know of as Wayne Williams stepped from behind the wall to block us off from going down the stairs. He says his two cousins got away and he knocked on a neighbor's door for safety. Which is how I was able to tell in such detail everything he was wearing. He still longs for a definite closure. I really got sad about it. Like the family of Michael McIntosh. He will always take me riding on the back of the bike. They lost their 23-year-old brother in 1981. We don't have no closure. We don't know who, why. So we need to find out who's responsible. Before Wayne Williams became a suspect, a separate secret investigation was underway. Who was involved and why was it kept a secret until now? It's long been assumed that Wayne Williams is to blame for all the Atlanta child murders, but as he was emerging as the key suspect in the case, another set of suspects stayed almost entirely under the radar until now. In a story you only see here, we comb through thousands of pages to bring you a secret investigation into possible KKK involvement. Explain to us what we're looking at. So this is the official Missing and Murdered Children's Task Force file. These are approximately 30,000 pages. Retired 11 Alive journalist Paul Crawley covered the case extensively as the nightmare unfolded, terrorizing Atlanta's black neighborhoods between 1979 to 1981. But there was a separate, top secret investigation that was apparently withheld from the public because Atlanta was, quote, faced with an extremely explosive racial problem, end quote. The KKK investigation, which was referred to as the 8100 file, investigated claims suggesting the Ku Klux Klan could be responsible for the Atlanta Chow murders. According to the documents, the investigation lasted for two months and ended a month before Wayne Williams was considered a suspect. The 8100 file was not presented during the Wayne Williams trial. Former juror Clarice Flournoy Green helped convict Williams, who's serving a life sentence for the murder of two adult men. How y'all doing? He was linked to the child murders, but was never convicted. 
here you are in Atlanta, and you convicted in Atlanta, and a young black male at that. She stands behind her decision based on the evidence that was available. Do you feel if this was presented during that time that maybe it could have changed the hearts and minds of some of the jurors who were sitting in the courtroom with you? It may have, depending on what's all in there, since we didn't get a chance to see it. The operation includes weeks of physical surveillance, wiretaps on phone conversations, polygraph tests, and information from informants who knew the Klan members. The investigation closely focused on the death of 14-year-old Luby Jeter, outlining information that a Klan member was responsible for his murder. According to documents, the then GBI director, Phil Peters, asked for it to be kept a separate investigation, that if the investigation, quote, leaked out, it would possibly cause a race riot, end quote. Documents indicate that Klansmen were followed for weeks to find a link between them and victim Luby Jeter, who apparently came in contact with one of them after he bumped his go-kart on a Klan member's car. The informant stated that the Klansman was angered by that and, quote, admitted that he wanted to kill Jeter, end quote. Luby Jeter's body was found February 5, 1981. Documents reveal the conversations that were monitored. The informant claimed a Klansman asked him to help on the child murders. He was given a polygraph test and passed. The source advised that the KKK was, quote, creating an uprising among the blacks, that they were killing the children, and that they are going to do one each month until things blow up, end quote. Two months after the investigation started, the 8100 file says the Klansmen were brought in for questioning and given a polygraph test and passed. According to the documents, that's when the investigation was considered closed. Decades after the killing spree started, the debate of who did it still continues. Crawley says this story remains just as complicated as the day he started reporting on it. It was pretty frightening for all of us because we knew that whoever it was was out there watching everything we did and said, and that was pretty scary. Moments after this report first aired, my phone rang. What compelled you after all these years to come forward? I'm getting ready to die. It's that simple. Moments after we aired that exclusive report connecting the KKK to the Atlanta child murders, we got a call from a man claiming he was one of the informants in that investigation. And after vetting his identity, we sat down with him to hear for the first time why this insider believes the investigation is far from over. What compelled you after all these years to come forward? Um, is it something that's been weighing heavy on your heart? I'm getting ready to die. It's that simple. This is a man we'll refer to as Larry. We're keeping his identity undercover because he fears retribution for what he's about to reveal. He says he lived a double life as a Klan member during the top secret KKK investigation called the 8100 file. Nearly 40 years ago, the investigation looked into controversial claims that suggested the Klan could be responsible for the Atlanta Chow murders. This is the most heinous crimes committed in the nation killing those kids what harm did they do anybody none the missing murdered children as always stuck with you did anyone ever ask you why do you care about these black children a lot of agents have asked me why do you care they're I hate that word with a passion. I'm repeating what was told to me. I meant no personal animosity whatsoever towards it. Is that a word you used or was that ever part of your vocabulary? Never was. You can't address someone civil and with respect don't address them at all. Documents state that investigators had at least two strategically placed sources. Larry says he became one after a Klan member approached him. And he uh, asked me if I wanted to join the Klan. And so he did, as an undercover agent. Then I was asked to be the bodyguard of the Grand Dragon. As Larry shared his story, he outlined in details information about the individuals profiled in the KKK investigation. After four or five meetings, uh, the missing and murdered children come up. And 
says, we got to get them We got to start a war. That's exactly what the 8100 file details. Within the documents, law enforcement officials explain that the investigation was kept secret and sealed away from the public due to fears it would cause a race riot. 11 Alive first reported on the 8100 file back in 1986 and we uncovered it recently. The Klan wasn't after uh, girls, they were after males. Cause males could cause a lot of problems when they got big, when they growed up. Larry says he wore an audio recorder which could record up to 10 hours. Documents show the audio recordings were approved by authorities. You gotta find a lot of records was intentionally destroyed by these agencies. They didn't want the public to know. He's right. We confirmed that all audio recordings, including those wiretaps, were destroyed. When Wayne Williams was convicted of two, I said, oh, we quit. This is it. We can close it out. The GBI helped lead the original KKK investigation. A spokesperson says they destroyed the evidence once agents dismissed a link to the Klan. Documents also state that APD was also involved in the 8100 file. They told us, quote, our investigators have not encountered any files outlining KKK involvement. Larry also recalls details about the boy mentioned in the files, Luby Jeter, who one day bumped his go-kart into a Klan member's car. They referred to him as a kid had run into a car, a truck or something with a, a four-wheeler or a go-kart or something. And on February 5th, 1981, Luby Jeter was found dead. I hope they find justice. They're still human, they still bleed, and uh, they hurt. And as far as reopening the case, he thinks nothing new will surface. I do not believe they're going to get anywhere. I guess only time will tell, right? Time will tell. I could hear it in your voice and in your emotions that this is a story that has stayed with you. I can't do nothing for him. Uh, let's drop it. Wayne Williams is locked up, but not staying silent. It's not just the suffering me and my family and children. This is nothing compared to what you Next, what the longtime suspect is saying about the new developments in the case. In the wake of the case being reopened, one of the 12 jurors responsible for putting Wayne Williams in prison for life is explaining the verdict for the first time. It's an 11 Alive exclusive. Does it surprise you that the case all of a sudden is resurfacing? Doesn't surprise me because I've seen it over the years when he files for appeals. For you, what specifically made up your mind? Well, after seeing all the evidence that was presented and so the public thought one way and we witnessed another. We saw everything that happened. We listened to everything that happened. You are not in that courtroom every day from sunup to almost sundown. When you hear all these different theories, you know, what comes to your mind as why there are so many different ideas of what might have happened in Atlanta during that time? A lot of people just didn't know what happened. And I've always had the idea that I don't believe one person could do all of that by themselves. I always thought he had some help, but it just never came out. I'm pretty sure there was a lot of responsibility that weighed on your shoulders. Did you feel the pressure, regardless of what you guys voted during that trial, that that was a big decision and a big responsibility? Yes, because it's like, here you are in Atlanta, and you can convicted in Atlanta, and a young black male at that. What message do you have for all those family members that are still waiting for their day of justice? I would be more than happy if, if they could find closure. And for the Atlanta community to know for sure that this is what happened. The person that's in jail is the person that should be there. Wayne Williams is still fighting to defend himself from behind bars. During a recent community forum, Williams called in, proclaiming his innocence to the crowd of family members and community leaders. It was the first time the long accused suspect spoke out about the investigation reopening and his own hopes for justice. What's really hurt me about this whole thing is it, not just the suffering me and my family and children. This is nothing compared to what you and 
While Williams was convicted of killing two adults, he was never put on trial for the murders of any of the children. We'll keep following the investigation as 29 families watch and wait for word that a killer is finally brought to justice once and for all. I'm Naima Abdullahi. Thank you for watching.